Now, my second part was to talk a little bit about the research advances in dystonia and perhaps some suggestion for further works. Now, some years ago, I had been asked to, to do something very similar uh, to talk about the recent advances and recent developments in dystonia. And I'd done that, but I'd also sort of mentioned uh, some of the um, uh, some of the unmet needs and what was required and what was happening in the field of dystonia. So I'm using those slides, but also uh, adding things which have happened recently. So from the clinical perspective, I think the recent uh, dystonia classification consensus statement I predicted would help us define homogeneous forms of dystonia, help us find new genetic forms. I think this recognition of the non-motor aspects of dystonia uh, going beyond the motor phenotype has become more and more important in uh, understanding that apart from having the motor phenotype, the non-motor aspects uh, such as anxiety, depression and others are important. Uh, there has been some increasing prevalence in um, uh, dystonia, uh, but I think uh, it is still very important for us to collaborate better, to take better studies uh, over Europe to find the various genetic forms and their uh, penetrance. Uh, as predicted, there have been a number of advances in genetics. So there have been at least eight to 10 new genes discovered for isolated dystonia in the past five years. These are just some names here. cis one ano 3 genal for isolated uh, dystonia. Some other genes for complex dystonia, uh, KMT2B, is extremely important. Childhood onset dystonia with a particular phenotype seems very common. Some recessive dystonia uh, over here, HBCA and VPS16. Uh, and I think with the uh, exome sequencing and whole generation uh, genome sequencing, um, further eight to 10 uh, monogenic genes can be expected, I'm sure, in the, in the near future. One area I think which has been lacking is uh, the genome-wide association studies. This would be important for looking at genetic risk factors where we are not able to identify perhaps monogenic genes. Um, uh, this is an important area. Uh, uh, there's only been one or two GVAS studies, so that's important. Uh, there have been some endophenotypes uh, described, but I think uh, um, uh, there is a need for uh, better endophenotypes, including genetic uh, risk factors. And then I predicted that there would be common pathways uh, between the different genetic forms. And indeed, this is turning out to be the case. So the discovery of the new genes is for the first time telling us about the shared mechanisms and also the shared pathways of the dystonia genes. So over here, as can be seen, there's a number of um, pathways and networks of genes which are either being co-expressed, co-localized, or indeed there might even be physical interaction of the proteins coded by the different genes. So for example, TAP1 and DYT1, there's an interaction. KMT2B has some interaction with TAP1 and TOR1. So uh, more and more of this is going to be recognized. And uh, uh, what has come about is that there are at least three different shared mechanisms or pathways, uh, calcium homeostasis, so hippocalcin, CACNA1A, NO3, KCTD, all of these are involved in some way or the other in uh, calcium uh, signaling of pathways. Neurodevelopmental defects, um, uh, ER or trafficking, uh, TOR1A, TAP1, all of these are involved there. And then of course, dopaminergic systems and neurotransmitter vesicular release. So many of the genes in the dopamine synthesis pathway, uh, GCH1, uh, TH, et cetera, has come about. And uh, th this uh, number of publications in this regard uh, on the emerging and converging molecular mechanisms, and really good to see that uh, there are these uh, interesting um, 
pathways being recognized. Because if we recognize the pathophysiological mechanisms here, there might be ways to uh, interact or modulate uh, these pathways to be able to produce uh, um, uh, uh, some uh, treatments uh, which are linked to the uh, interactions with these particular pathways uh, or defects. And uh, here again, uh, this is a quite a remarkable uh, paper because I mentioned to you about the non-motor aspects. So what is being found over here by Niccolo Mencacci, this very um, uh, really good work that the dystonia genes uh, seem to converge in specific neurons and share neurobiology with the psychiatric disorder genes. So there is a um, link between the uh, dystonic conditions uh, where we know that there are a lot, of, a lot of people who have anxiety and other psychiatric features. So one explanation for that may be this uh, convergence in the uh, neurons and the shared neurobiology between the motor dystonia genes and the psychiatric disorders. So something uh, quite uh, interesting in this aspect. We had, uh, 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 we had wondered about environmental factors because it has been noticed that <clears throat> most of the dystonia genes uh, have a low penetrance. So the question is, uh, are there environmental or other factors which are influencing the penetrance of uh, dystonia? And in this context, uh, there have been very few studies. There is one on DYT1 and there's some on craniosurvical dystonia, but really we require bigger studies in this regard to look at uh, the penetrance and case control studies, perhaps in genetically defined groups to tell us more about environmental factors. And I think collaborative studies will be required. So this is one unmet need, uh, which is important to be rectified. Again, in pathophysiology, um, there's a prediction that we may have better biomarkers and signatures of dystonia uh, looking at electrophysiology and also imaging using different mechanisms, uh, methods, volumetric, tactrography, ligands. And what has come out from that in recent papers is a number of uh, publications about the role of the cerebellum. So Bazjina and his group have uh, been uh, talking about this in the past, but a number of papers now uh, talking about the role of the cerebellum. Uh, this was a, a quite a simple but a nice paper about the evidence from the clinic showing that cerebellar atrophy or cerebellar lesions were seen in 14% of cases uh, seen in the clinic with late onset cervical segmental dystonia. Some of these people have soft cerebellar signs and therefore suggesting that um, the, 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 at least in a small number of cases, there may be a role of the cerebellum. But this has now been also established by looking at network localization of patients with cervical dystonia and those with causal brain lesions. And uh, it, it suggests that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, um, both of these groups, those with brain um, lesions causing dystonia, but also those with idiopathic cervical dystonia, there seems to be some involvement of the cerebellar and somatosensory regions and pathways. So there is a network localization, again, um, mentioning that the cerebellum may, or its pathways may have an important role in the development of dystonia. Now, how exactly that happens, we don't know, but uh, certainly uh, this is an interesting area. We had predicted that uh, uh, better animal models uh, may help with the better understanding of the pathophysiological mechanisms and for potential curative therapies or gene therapies. And in this context, there have been a couple of papers which I think are important to be recognized. This one is very exciting uh, from Bill Dower and his group uh, in their dystonia mouse model of DYT1, showing that torsion B overexpression prevents the uh, um, uh, rescues the torsion A loss of function mediated abnormal movements and uh, degeneration. So these findings uh, identify torsion B as a 
potent modifier of torsion A loss of function phenotypes and suggest that increasing or augmenting uh, torsion B may retard or prevent the development of DYT dystonia, DYT1 dystonia. Now, um, to put this into uh, uh, <clears throat> practice or to develop this would be quite an interesting thing. And I'm sure uh, uh, people are working in this area uh, to consider um, the uh, clinical trials. The other one, which is interesting, another form of uh, rare dystonia is the AADC deficiency. And uh, so far there hasn't been a, <clears throat> um, 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 a particular uh, um, corrective treatments, but uh, um, uh, um, uh, Edulis Biotherapeutics uh, in Cambridge is developing a um, gene therapy using a, I don't know, associated virus uh, to correct uh, AADC deficiency and work in animal models has already taken place showing there is a uh, promising safety and efficacy um, in increased uh, uh, dopamine production and uh, gains in motor and cognitive function. And uh, a trial is at the moment underway uh, and they are trying to recruit patients with AADC deficiency. This will be very interesting gene therapy uh, um, in dystonia. Uh, albeit a rare dystonia condition. But uh, given the um, experience uh, from the Huntington's trial, the SMA trial, this is really fascinating that uh, we are considering gene therapy also for certain types of rare dystonias. And finally, in the treatment aspects, uh, I had uh, suggested that uh, it may be a good idea to consider uh, on-demand services for botulinum toxin, etc. Uh, there are new types of botulinum toxin uh, being developed. Uh, we know that deep brain stimulation is now um, very widely accepted as a, a very good treatment for particular forms of uh, dystonia, particularly isolated dystonia, for example, due to DYT1 or epsilon sarcoglycan-related dystonia all of which respond very well uh, to DBS as well as tardive dystonia. But uh, uh, people are now talking about, just like in the Parkinson field, that the technical aspects of DBS can be improved. Uh, there may be consideration of new targets apart from the GPI. And uh, this uh, so-called uh, adaptive feedback uh, um, type of uh, DBS is on the anvil. It's already been uh, done in uh, Parkinson's disease, but uh, uh, there is also a consideration of doing the same in, uh, in dystonia, and uh, this is being pursued actively. We had uh, mentioned uh, in the past about experimental treatments, uh, RTMS or direct current uh, stimulation, uh, uh, non-invasive, a number of other things as well and uh, wondering about delivering RTMS uh, uh, um, or direct current uh, or even combination of these different techniques. And uh, indeed, uh, um, uh, uh, there has been a, a landmark paper on the uh, suppression of uh, essential tremor uh, with uh, phase lock disruption of its temporal coherence um, using stimulation uh, over the cerebellum and uh, as we know that uh, tremor can be an integral part of dystonia, this could be something also worth considering in people with uh, dystonia and dystonic tremor. So this is an area which I think uh, may be explored in the future. So I've sort of uh, taken you through a little run through about the different advances in uh, dystonia, but also predicting that there will be further advances made in genetics of dystonia. I think uh, we uh, should be looking into identifying risk factors, both genetic and environmental. Um, understanding the pathophysiology uh, from the genetic disorders, uh, I think may be applicable to all forms of dystonia, uh, just like it has happened in Parkinson's disease. 
So the basic mechanisms, circuits, systems, neurotransmitter, animal models, I think will lead to a potential for a more curative therapies, uh, I suspect uh, in the not too far future. So it's an exciting time in the field of dystonia because we are understanding more about the pathophysiology driven of course through the uh, advances in the genetics and also understanding networks. Thank you.